Many of you, uh, you know, I know I, I grew up in the church. My dad's a pastor, and so we went every week, you know, did all that stuff. And I don't remember a whole lot of uh, what was said or done, you know, in church when I was a kid. But there was this one gal, lady we had, uh, my dad invited to come sing at our church. And, her, and I remember her, and I remember what uh, song she sang. Uh, her name was Algitha Brown, and she was the lead vocalist for Robert Schuller's, you know, uh, church in Southern California. And my dad had attended uh, a leadership conference out there and heard her sing and said, we got to get Algitha Brown. And so they brought Algitha Brown out from Southern California, and she, uh, her, she, her voice was just angelic. It was just magical, and uh, it was really wonderful. And, and he, the, I remember, here's what her signature song was. In the morning of my life, I shall look to the sunrise. At a moment in my life when the world is new, and the blessing I shall ask that God will grant me to be brave and strong and true and to fill the world with love my whole life through. What a great thought. Man, if we could do that, right? If we could have that, to be brave and strong and true and to fill the world with love. I mean, still, I, 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 that song still kind of guides my life. Now, we'll circle back here in a little bit with that, but we've, for the last several weeks, we've been in a message series where we've taken a look at the 23rd Psalm. And even if you don't go to church, you've probably heard that psalm before at funerals or, uh, you, you, you know, it's an important, most everybody knows that the Lord is my shepherd, and you can probably even quote it. My father-in-law, who's dealing with uh, some dementia pretty strong dementia issues right now. Linda was with him yesterday and they were in the car and she said that, she said, uh, Mark's been preaching through the 23rd Psalm. And so he begins to quote it. He doesn't remember a whole lot, but he remembers the 23rd Psalm. And you're gonna need this. You're gonna need it. And so this has been super important for us as we've been navigating through uh, the, all the seasons of life. And he comes to the climactic last verse, and we're gonna deal with it today, the last verse, though we're only gonna do with the first half of it, and then next week when we close it down, and boy, you gotta be here for next weekend, because you wanna be able, I, I want you to be able to say, say this, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So let's go look, take a look, Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, right? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now you probably, maybe if you memorized it like I did from the King James Version, it was more like this. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Because if I'm under the care of the shepherd, and it all kind of goes back to that first verse, the Lord is my shepherd. And if we can't say that, then this verse doesn't apply. None of these verses apply. But when the Lord is our, our shepherd and we've come under his care, uh, then, then goodness and mercy will follow me. That will be in the, my path as I, as I walk along what's left behind. Now, a lot of us leave stuff in the path. A lot of us leave stuff in the path. What's following you? Am I willing to come under the ownership of the good shepherd? That's the, right. He own, and that, that's probably why we don't like, I mean, truly, it, I like the shepherd, but I really don't want to come under his ownership. That word is bothersome. 1 Corinthians six twenty says, for God bought you with a high price, which I want to point out to you, you weren't on sale. Right, it's like uh, we got a damaged one here. Uh, it's half off, thirty uh, percent off rebate thing. No, nope, he pays full price for every single one of us. He's willing to do that. You've been bought with a high price. He w is willing to pay, and then we're his. We're in his flock. We're part of his care. So you must honor God with your body. He pays a high price. And the result of his leadership in my life is that goodness and mercy will follow me no matter what might happen. Goodness and mercy will follow. This might seem easy when our health is fine, when life is good, of course. But when my body starts to fail, not so sure his ownership in my life is worth it. 
I don't think he knows what he's doing. I keep asking him to fix it. It doesn't. Or when my income is going really well. Yes, goodness. And look, at, look how good my life is. When everything seems to be soaring, when the economy is going in the right direction. Uh, yes, goodness and mercy. Look at how good and blessed I am. But when it doesn't go so well, does goodness and mercy follow us? Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 through 10 The Apostle Paul says, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have an opportunity, we should do good to everyone. Everyone. Especially to those in the family of faith. See, if we, it's this, you reap what you sow. So if you do good, goodness will follow. If you don't, aren't doing good things for people, goodness doesn't flow. It's an amazing statement here. You reap what you sow, and the Bible tells us that, uh, that boy, it, it's tiresome to do good. Don't get tired. It's exhausting. Would you agree with me that doing good is exhausting? It always is. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him amazing little commentary on the life of Jesus. He went around doing good. And the reason he was able to do that is he full of the Holy Spirit and power. Because doing good is exhausting. It's tiresome. Being a good neighbor is tiring. Anybody have neighbors that are annoying? You don't, have, don't raise your hand because they might be here. I mean, you don't do that. <laughs> See, I don't know if you follow, uh, if you're on Twitter, um, we, uh, our fireworks bonanza uh, hit the big time this week because Mean Streets of Omaha was tweeting about us. And if you are at all on Twitter, you probably follow Mean Streets of Omaha. And if you do, it makes you very nervous about our city. It's constant mischief all the time. And it's super funny, but it's constant mischief. Anyway, some guy didn't like our fireworks thing because there was noises. And, and, he, and he used some interesting words. Uh, to describe what was happening uh, in his life. At, you know, and, and so um, I found it very comical, and, and Linda would not let me respond. Um, <laughs> but, but, there was, but um, there was one person who said something like this. Um, it just went on and on. It was so annoying. It's a fireworks show. You know what's annoying? My neighbor at 2 o'clock with the party bus. That's what's annoying. You know what's annoying? My, my neighbor who's got a, 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 a barbecue grill, and he's out there at 3 o'clock in the morning putting fire in there. That's what's annoying. You know that's annoying? The, the neighbor who's got a car that's been at the same spot for the last six months because it can't run. That's what's annoying. Being a good neighbor, right, is difficult, it's super hard, it's not easy, it's exhausting. Do good to everyone? The guy with the barbecue? Who doesn't even give you stuff? I gotta be good to him? The young couple with the party bus? I get it. On a Saturday night, do you not know that I have to get up early, early to do my job? Yes, they do. <laughs> Don't care. <laughs> right? Anybody have people in our lives that are difficult to deal with? Sure, we all do. We sometimes even call them spouses. I don't know. You know we just <laughs> deal with them. In-laws, all kinds of stuff. Let's not become weary in doing good. Being a good neighbor, loving our neighbor, right? Loving our neighbor is tiring. We know the story, probably in the Bible, the Good Samaritan. Again, I like the little phrase there, good, right? He's around doing good, this Samaritan. And for those of us who are not Jewish, which probably would be about everybody, um, we don't understand the culture there and the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other because of what? The skin color and their religion. Boy, things have not changed The Jews don't like the Samaritans, and the Samaritans don't like the Jews. You think racial tension is a new thing. Nope, it is not. Religious tension is a new thing. No, it is not. So Jesus tells the story to some Jews, 
and he, the hero of the story is a Samaritan. So the Samaritan, is, uh, there's a guy that gets beat up and left for dead, and a couple of religious Jews, Jewish guys walk by him, do nothing, avoid him. There's no, right, and no, nobody's helping. And then Jesus says, a Samaritan stops by and helps him. Takes care of his wounds, takes him to an inn, pays the innkeeper a whole bunch of money to take care of him until he gets healthy, find a doctor, take care of this guy, I'll, I'll make sure that we're good when we're done. So it cost him time and money. It didn't cost the other guys anything. It never costs us anything when we don't do anything. Jesus kind of wraps up that little story in Luke chapter 10, verse 36. Now, which of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? The man replied, well, the one who showed him mercy. Yep. Go and do the same. Goodness and mercy. It was hard to admit that the Samaritan was the man who was doing good. They didn't even have the right skin color. Didn't even have the right religion. If goodness and mercy are gonna follow us, it's gonna to have to cost us something. That's why it's quite possible that we're just tired of doing some of that stuff. And that's why the Apostle Paul has to remind us, don't get weary in doing good. Do good to everyone you can. Therefore, if we have the opportunity, let's do that for all people. One time Jesus was invited to, the, to have dinner with a Pharisee who was a religious leader, very important, probably influential, fairly powerful person in town. Uh, in the first century, the, oftentimes the courtyards of the homes was where people would eat if it was nice out, especially if it was a big deal. And so having Jesus as your home was a big deal. And the Pharisee had asked Jesus to come and eat at his home. They're reclining there. They, they didn't sit at tables. They would recline in the courtyard area. And people were allowed to come and watch. It was kind of weird. But, but they didn't have TV, so what are they going to do? Hey, let's go to the Pharisee's house. Jesus is going to be there, and let's go watch the show. That's what they did. So people are gathered around and they're watching uh, uh, the good food being served and conversation. And there, uh, and there was a woman there who was um, struggling. She's crying. And it's ugly cry stuff. I mean, it's not, it's mascara. You know, so it's bad. And she's crying so much she can't even get a hold of herself. And the host of that evening is a little bothered and it's awkward and, and um, he, he says under his breath, if this man, so referring to Jesus, if Jesus was a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Now, the Pharisee wasn't even a prophet and he knows who she is. So you think Jesus doesn't know? See, the Pharisee has no time for her, and he's not really impressed with Jesus. So here's what Jesus says in Luke chapter 7, verse 40. Then Jesus answered his thoughts, which should just scare the heebie-jeebies out of you. Right? I, I, I don't think I want to have dinner with Jesus. If he knows my thoughts, and the cool thing is, he does, and he still wants to have dinner with me. That's the cool part. So he answers his thoughts, Simon, I have something to say to you. <laughs> Everybody leans in. Go ahead, teacher. Simon has no idea. Jesus tells him a story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other, but neither could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more than that? After that, right? Uh, Simon, I suppose, uh, um, I suppose the one who he canceled the larger debt? Now, see, isn't that great? Is that Jesus gives you multiple choices, only two choices, A or B. I think it's the guy, right? That's right. He got it right. He aced the test 100%. He's good, right? He's kind of golden. He's kind of feeling like, mm-hmm. I love this. 
Verse 44, then he turns to the woman and says to Simon. So he's looking right at her. But, he, but the message is for Simon as well. Look at this woman kneeling here. He's saying this to the woman. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears, wiped them with their hair. You didn't even greet me with a kiss. So he's looking right at her. But from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. She's been anointing my feet with rare perfume. Simon, you did nothing. I know you're good, but your goodness cost you nothing. I tell you, and he's looking it right at her, I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who has been forgiven little shows only little love. Jesus said to the woman now, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins as if he could? And then Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I mean, is that just awesome? Can you imagine? Here she is. And she's got a pretty bad reputation. and She's earned it. But she is so captivated by this man that she had to be close to him and she shows up in a dinner party and she can't hold it together. And somehow she has figured it out that this man has shown her love and respect and care that no other man has ever done. Most men have used her and abused her and thrown a few dollars on the bed as they left. Amazing moment here. Your sins are forgiven. He could have said anything. He could have said thanks. Crazy thing, Jesus knew who she was and he knows who you are, who I am, all too well. And I typically, I truly would think that Jesus would be grossed out by me. And he would say the same thing. Mark, uh, your sins are many. How we long, right? Do you, do you not long to hear those words from him? Forgiven. Simon would just see people like uh, a hireling would for taking care of the sheep. Simon didn't care about her. Jesus thought, basically said, I'm, I'm gonna pay for you completely on a cross someday. I'm, you're bought and paid for, you're mine. I have, you're valuable, I care. But for Simon, it was, he didn't care. He didn't care at all. Do I see the people the same way? Am I willing to overlook the past or... Do I tend to hang on to things? Can I extend forgiveness at all? If I can't, I won't understand grace or mercy. I know very little bit about it. You see, does goodness and mercy follow me? Do I leave a trail of gladness or do I a tra trail of sadness? Do I leave a trail of forgiveness or bitterness? Do I leave a trail of contentment or conflict? Of joy or frustration? Peace or chaos? Goodness and mercy? When, do I, to, when I have the opportunity to do good, do I do it to everyone, everybody I can? Might be a friend or a neighbor, co-worker, somebody in your small group who needs a listening ear. You might even hear stuff at church and they say, hey, you know, you could help us out. You know, well, that's an opportunity just to do good, to get involved, to have a chance to spread goodness and mercy. Psalm 51, verse 1 says, have mercy on me. So here's David, who also wrote the 23rd. He says this, and this is after he's had some pretty massive missteps uh, in his life. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. And if it isn't for that, there, we have no chance in hell of ever being able to have uh, the 
fact that we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So because of your unfailing love, because of your great passion, blot out the stain of my sins. Matthew 18, 21, Peter says to him, so this is our response to the grace of God. Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? That just seems like a big number. Right, if somebody does something to you over and over, like, I mean, three times is fairly annoying. Four is like, what is your problem? Five, like, knock it off. Well, can you forgive me? I'm not sure now. Seven times is a big number, right? Nope. Jesus says, not, uh, not seven. How about 70 times seven? And I'm sure they're thinking, well, that's, that's impossible. I'm not good at math, but it's a lot. How am I supposed to do that? So he says, well, there's a kingdom of heaven that can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of the debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars and he couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me. I'll pay it all back. His master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to another servant, a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars, grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him, begged for a little bit more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And the king called the man in who had been forgiven. He said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't, ha shouldn't you have mercy on the fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. And truly, when we're not able to forgive, we will be tormented. I'm pretty sure if I had asked you today, is there some folks that you've not, you know, haven't forgiven? You've held on to some stuff. You could, you, you, would, you could be ushered right back to that very moment. For some of us, it's, it's, it's a, you know, we, we go back to high school. We can remember that very moment when that kid did that, to, made fun of us, or, or that, our ex-wife, way back. I'm never going to forgive her, ever. Right? And that will lead to a torturous life. And I know it's difficult when we, it's like, well, how am I I'm supposed to forgive them? It's like as I'm saying it just doesn't matter. Well, or what they did was okay. No, 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 it was never okay. Sin is never okay. But what I am going to say is that because Jesus extended me great mercy, I will be merciful as well. See, Christ followers, we should be the most forgiving people on the planet. We should just ooze it out of our life and our body that we're more than willing to extend forgiveness and grace to anybody and everyone who needs it in our area of life. Unfortunately, as Christ followers, we have oftentimes are the ones who hang on to it a lot longer than anybody else. So who do you have to forgive today? Because if you want goodness and mercy to follow you. See, in a moment, we'll have communion. We're, we celebrate communion here every weekend, and we have a chance to kind of look at the grace and forgiveness of God in the bread and the cup of juice. And it's pretty easy to go, well, okay. He forgave me, paid for my life with that life, right? And maybe in that moment where you just have a quiet moment where you can just say, you know what, I, I need to be, not only am I going to ask that he continues to forgive me, but that I would have enough courage to forgive a person that I've been holding on to for a long time, right? So back to Algitha's song. 
In the evening of my life, I shall look to the sunset. At a moment in my life when the night is due, and the question I shall ask only God could answer, was I brave and strong and true? And did I fill the world with love my whole life through? May that be true for our lives today. Father God, thank you so much for filling the world with love. For you loved the world that you gave your only son. And all we have to do is believe in him and we will not perish but have everlasting life. That's good news for this sinner. And Father God, I at times have been so guilty of passing people by and I have an opportunity to do good. I truly want goodness and mercy to follow me all the days of my life. That what I leave behind for people in my, yeah, on the path that I've been on is good stuff. Not bitterness. Not anger. Not jealousy or rage. Father God, in, in our world today, what I see being left behind is 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 tremendous anger, tremendous rage, tremendous frustration. Did we fill the world with love? We're being consumed and eaten alive by hate. So perhaps it needs just to start today with me. I want to fill the world with love my whole life through. Help me to do that. In Christ we pray, amen.